sometimes be at the railroad, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then we'll have some, any questions. Um, I might first want to talk about the models here. We, what we have depicted are three eras of railroading in Livingston County. The train in the forefront here is also, it's made a little shortened so it will fit on the table, but it's sort of a typical freight train that might apply the rails of the Pennsylvania Railroad about 1915. Uh, that railroad came up um, through Portageville, I had a, a quick uh, branch into Nunday, through Tuscarora, Mount Morris, uh, Tylerville, Fowlerville, and on in, in, to Rochester. It's, it's a branch to Pennsylvania. And saw maybe two to three trains a day, only freight trains at this time. 1950 was set up the time the first diesel, <coughs> the steam engines were on their way out, and uh, that represents the style of diesel that was. Uh, typical to freight trains on the line about that time. Um, the next two trains here further back represent uh, trains from the 1890s. Uh, the first the freight train on the very same railroad, you can see the contrast of equipment. They're both I mean, in size. These are, you might mention, these are all the same scale. Everything here is HO scale, which is basically uh, 3.5 millimeters to the foot, about 187th real size. So what you see is proportionally correct, even though some of these larger items current day seem much larger than, you know, than the other other trains of the same scale. So that's the true proportion. And uh, this is a freight train. You can mostly you can really contrast the style of equipment, the size especially. And back in that era, of course, passenger trains were very prominent too. So we wanted to represent an ex express passenger train here. Um, probably half the trains flying the rails at that time were passenger trains. They carry mail, milk, and other express items, and uh, this represents a passenger train. This might have uh, ran in one of the branches of the Erie Railroad through through uh, Livingston County. And back here is some contemporary equipment. And it's, like I said, it's, it's huge, and uh, it shows the change in technology from the time of uh, even 50 years ago. How much railroading has changed? This large car here, which is probably more than twice the length of any freight car from the 1950s is used to carry uh, automobiles, uh, LP gas car, even this car here is a sort that might be carrying grain or, or rock salt. Much, much larger. Um, technology became a lot much more efficient too. This represents one unit of an ar articulated container car. These were well flat cars. Uh, the containers sit as low as possible so they can be double stacked. Mm -hmm. And uh, even so, a lot of the bridges and clearances had to be raised. And basically, these trains are double stacked. They're much taller than uh, anything else, but uh, a very efficient way of carrying freight. Uh, you know, these aren't, uh, aren't really single cars, but they, they're what they call articulated. They share a pair of trucks. And that is a general way of carrying, carrying freight today. Most freight today no longer rides in boxcars, but in fact rides in containers, which we you know, and trains on trucks. On, uh, Ocean-going vessels, and uh, it allows great, great, much greater flexibility in the transportation system. So this sort of represents that mode of transportation. Railroads today actually carry more freight than they ever have in the history of America. They, but they carry a much smaller percentage of freight that's uh, traveling between cities, just because of the uh, the truck and highway competition. They have a much larger share today. But uh, they still carry a respectable amount of freight. Um, this brought this one locomotive here. It's probably actually a locomotive maybe from the early 70s or late 1960s, but we want to bring it along because it's representative of our uh, Genesee and Wyoming system letters for the Rochester and Southern Railroad. Mm -hmm. So the models we've talked about will get down to the history of Livingston County and its railroads. The most important railroad in Livingston County is the Erie and its affiliates. It's the predominant railroad, so I'll refer you to the first part of your map. The Erie came through New York State in the late 40s and uh, early 1950s. It was built through the southern tier, the main line. It was much of, as much of a political enterprise as it was an economic enterprise. So New York State was growing economically because of the Erie Canal, but there was a whole, a whole complex of communities in the southern tier that were basically starving. They didn't have any way of bringing in resources. They didn't have any way of shipping out their goods. And the Erie, Erie Railroad was sort of a consolation prize to those communities. It was built mostly to 
connect those communities, not with uh, not with economics in mind, but basically to give these communities something. And it's it's terminals for the eastern shore of the Hudson River, a place called Piermont, which wasn't really anywhere near New York City. That was its eastern terminal. Its western terminal was uh, the Erie Lake port of Dunkirk. So it sort of was a railroad from nowhere to nowhere. And it, it connected the major southern tier cities, so Holy and Salamanca and Port and things. But, but uh, left as it was, it definitely would have been a secondary player. And the economics soon exerted themselves, and it became necessary for the Erie to actually go somewhere, too. Uh, its eastern end branches were built to uh, New Jersey right across Manhattan, and eventually the area would establish a ferry service for both freight and passenger, uh, passengers and freight into Manhattan. But at the western end, which concerns us, we have this line going through the southern tier. It still exists, and it's actually about to be revived <coughs> uh, under the auspices of our own L.A. and L. Railroad, actually. It's called the Western New York of Pennsylvania now, and it's a line that runs out of Olean through Cuba, Friendship, Wellsville, and on to Hornell. And this was the main line, but it very soon became evident that this line needed to go somewhere. So the idea was, basically, you've got to get to the same western terminus that the Erie Canal has, which is Buffalo. So this problem was solved by building two branches off this main line. And they were uh, conceived just about 1850, 1851, the time the Erie itself was being completed. <coughs> the uh, the uh, the organizers knew that they needed another terminal, a real terminal in Buffalo. So there were two ways to get in Buffalo. One was to build a branch from Hornell, pretty much in a direct uh, south, uh, southwesterly direction. And uh, this is the line that still exists today. It was built from Hornell through Canisaraga, across the Lecture Forge <coughs> at the High Falls, and down through Castile, Warsaw, and on to Buffalo. This line, if you look, I believe it was originally called the Hornellsville and Attica, eventually the Buff Buffalo in New York City. They had a lot of names, but usually these were, these preliminary names were, were only in effect for a few years. Eventually they would come under control of the parent company, which was the Erie. Now, a competing, which started out as a competing line off the Erie to Buffalo was built from a point, a painted post. This is just west of Corning. And this is a line that really concerns Livingston County because this came right through the well, almost the heart of Livingston County. It came up through Savannah, Avoca, <coughs> Wayland, and then into Canisius, uh, Livonia, Avon, Caledonia, Leroy, and was actually heading to Batavia when something interesting happened. And that is, both these branches we've been talking about came under common ownership. And they thought, well, we do not need to run two parallel lines into Buffalo. The line was just about built the Buffalo from Attica. This was the, uh, the Buffalo, New York City. Like I said, this was the line that went over Letchworth Park today. And so the other one was, was had actually been built as far as Batavia, or as far as Batavia and uh, they came under common ownership. And they had actually built their grade. They had built their grade uh, several miles towards Buffalo. But the New York Central was also building towards Buffalo, and they coveted this grade. So they said, well, we'll buy it from you. And said, okay, that's fine. And what happened was they just, to, to complete this line, so it wouldn't dead end in the cave here, they just took a sudden <coughs> right angle turn, a left hand turn, and they were it straight down through Alexander and Attica. And you can see this on your map of the Erie system. I think maybe better if you look into the interior pages. This line, even though it was, when we got to Buffalo, the cave was headed for Buffalo. It stops, makes a right angle turn, and heads right down to Attica, which is the main line of the other railroad. Um, and the grander schemes of things on the area, this probably didn't have too much of an effect, but for Livingston County it did, because this meant that this line through Livingston would be forever doomed to secondary status. It would never see through freight of the type that was on its way between New York City and Chicago, or Buffalo and Chicago. It was always only going to see local freight and local passenger service, basically. This uh, decision doomed the line as, as a secondary line and eventually would result in part of its abandonment. But uh, in the 1860s, when this decision was made, it was a practical <coughs> decision. Both railroads were under the same ownership and they didn't need two lines to Buffalo. So that's, that's what we have. So we have it was the Buff Buffalo and Cohocton Valley originally, uh, later the Buffalo Corning in New York. 
And by Civil War time, they had all become under the umbrella of the Erie Railroad. So now we're looking at the system which uh, has a main line from, from New Jersey to Dunkirk with two branches um, going through to Buffalo. And uh, I might mention the second branch does touch upon Livingston County, but only two southern towns. It, they touch upon the town of uh, Nunday and the town of Porch. Okay, it's the station in Hunts in uh, what we mentioned from River Junction. Our, our, um, this line does catch, catch the corner of Livingston County, but it doesn't, it's never done too much to the development of Livingston County because not much is going on down in Portage or Monday. But uh, it was always, the, the Buffalo Corning in New York was always a prime server for Livingston County, touching up the communities that it did. So, the Erie Railroad had more expansion to do, and one obvious place to go once they had a line through Avon going east-west was to shoot a branch up to Rochester, where there was a lot of activity. And this was the Rochester and Genesee Valley Railroad. And, uh, and these were, this was built along with a pair of other railroads which served the Genesee Valley. The Rochester and Genesee Valley, a railroad called simply the Genesee Valley, which extended south from Avon to Mount Morris, and then another railroad called the Erie and Genesee Valley, which extended from Mount Morris to Dansville. Okay, so this was a, a new system of lines serving the Genesee Valley. And now, um, something they ought to mention here too, these lines were built four foot eight and a half inch gauge. Now by gauge, I mean the width of the track between rail centers, four feet eight and a half inch wide. And by the later 1850s, early 1860s, this is pretty much become settled as the standard gauge for America. We couldn't be building railroads in one state, one width, and railroads in another state, another width, because they could never interchange equipment. So it became obviously obvious that a practical solution had to be made, and that railroads had to settle on a single standard gauge. And somehow they had gravitated to this four feet, eight and a half inches. Now the Erie, I may mention, was not built to four foot, eight and a half inches originally. It was originally built six foot wide, huge railroad, actually. And at the time, railroads were more independent. They didn't, didn't interchange freight as much. It seemed like a practical solution. Later, this decision would come back and flag the area because they had to reduce their gauge. And that didn't happen until about 18, um, 1875 to 1880. The Erie track was reduced from six foot. Now, the, both the branches off the Erie were also originally built wide gauge. And the um, Buffalo Corning in New York, because of its secondary status, was one of the very last to be converted from six foot gauge to four foot eight and a half inch gauge. And now there's a photo, uh, I don't know if Bill has it, there's a photo of the Avon Depot in 1875 or 76, where the Avon Depot would have served both the east-west line, uh, the Buffalo Corning in New York, as well as this line we should discuss for the Genesee Valley from Rochester, you can see what they call dual gauge track. They put a third rail in, uh, where so that the uh, both styles of equipment could be used on the same track. And you can see the third rail in the Erie Yards and Avon in this picture. So this is the system we have now. I might mention the Erie itself as a player. I need to look at. Uh, it was sort of the poor man's railroad to Chicago. All. Uh, if you look at the uh, thing called primary players there on page one of the map. When rails were first developed in 1850, this was the part of America that was really growing as the greatest industrial complex probably in the world, and it needed to be, needed to be served by railroads. And the wealth, of course, was in the seaport, the seaport cities. And <coughs> there was a tendency for each of those to sponsor a railroad to the west, to the great Midwestern cities, the, to Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Chicago. And uh, there is sort of a railroad associated with each of the great seaport cities. The New York Central Hudson River Rail Railroad, under the um, dominance of the Vanderbilt family, built from Manhattan, right in the heart of Manhattan, up the Hudson River, and then along the shore of uh, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and the Great Lakes, it was described as a water level because it really had excellent, very few grades. And it's, a railroad doesn't want to encounter grades because they slow down the train. So it was basically a flat railroad built all the way from New York City to Chicago. The Erie was sort of, even though it was the first to reach the Great Lakes at Dunkirk, was sort of a poor man's railroad. It was, it had the longest route, and it was also burdened with a, uh, with a directorship which, uh, Perhaps you can't describe any better way to say 
contained quite a number of scoundrels. Okay? There, were, there were great financiers in the 19th century, but there are also bad guys, guys that were in it for their own personal gain, and the Erie seemed to have more than their share of these fellows on the directorship. Men like Jay Gould, Dan Daniel Drew, Jim Fisk, and a lot of these men, well, we see the same thing today. It's sort of the end of its day. They, they robbed the railroad for their personal gain, and it, it put a burden on the company that would uh, that it would suffer even into the 20th century. So the Erie had this bad gauge, it had a long route, and it had a poor management. Now, immediately to the south was the mighty Pennsylvania Railroad under the, the uh, under the directorship of Tom Scott, and that probably became the dominant railroad in America. Eventually, it would include almost 10% of all American railroading in terms of mileage or assets or whatever m measurement you might wish to use. The Pennsylvania was built out of Philadelphia and would eventually run its own branch into New York City under the Hudson River and back to a station in Manhattan. But it started in Philadelphia, built to Harrisburg, and then built west by two routes uh, to Chicago and Cincinnati. And probably the last Northeastern Railroad came out of uh, Baltimore, the Baltimore Railroad in Ohio. John Garrett was the personality most associated with that. That was built from Baltimore to Pittsburgh and then on to Chicago and Cincinnati. So you have these four big players about the time of the Civil War. These railroads are being consolidated. But um, among the four, the Erie was the poorest and probably maybe the least significant. But nevertheless, the Erie is what concerns us here most in, uh, in western New York because sandwiched as it was between New York Central and Pennsylvania, it was a railroad that served our area. So it was the predominant trunk line. So, okay, so we've got the Erie. I think we've described its construction. Two branch, a main line, two branches coming up, heading to Buffalo. Now there's a hub, and then uh, basically a north-south line coming out of Rochester down to Dansville. Now there would be one more little piece we should mention hardly of significance except it's of great significance today, and that is the Canisius Lake Railroad decided that there was a, a good recreation ex passenger excursion business in Lakeville. So at a point called Canisius Lake Junction, which was very um, between South Lima and Avon, a little railroad was built, an independent railroad called the Canisius Lake Railroad, right down to the shore of Canisius Lake. And that still exists today, of course, as, a, as an integral part of the one we have on Lake Railroad. It was originally built merely to serve the lake and the recreation business there. Uh, <coughs> summer excursion trains are very popular from Rochester and other locations, and they run the trains right down to where Vital Park is today. A steamship would take the people on a cruise for the afternoon, and it was uh, in the 19th century. That was a pretty classy way of spending your weekend. So, so we have the the Erie pretty much in place now. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the second rail in Livingston County, which is the Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania today is all gone, entirely gone, but uh, we have its legacy in the Genesee Valley Greenway. The, the, uh, the original press and predecessor of the Pennsylvania Railroad came before the Genesee Valley Canal. Much of, you know, much of the Greenway follows the uh, well, the path of the canal, but the original predecessor was called the Rochester Nunday and Pennsylvania Railroad. It predated the canal and was actually built while the canal was still up and running. In 1872, it was proposed to build this railroad from Coal Mountain to Pennsylvania in a north-south direction right into Rochester. There was a great deal of support from communities along the line, especially from Nunday. Uh, Nunday actually bonded itself. The community could do this then for $75,000 to assist construction of the railroad. Uh, Leicester was another community which bonded itself, I believe, for $30,000. And uh, it was a prime source of income. And uh, back then, it was a way of making money, even for sometimes an unscrupulous operator, because you might not be able to make any money operating a railroad, but you could make money building a railroad. So the construction company would go away with its pockets full, leaving the railroad whose economic prospects were very dubious. And this is the case of the Rochester Monday in Pennsylvania. It was graded uh, in portions actually from Belvedere in, in Allegheny County northward, all the way through Swains, through Monday, as far almost as Mount Morris, as far as Sanye actually. And the portions were graded in Chile in the towns of uh, and in the towns of York and even in Leicester, there's, if you know where to look, you can still find evidence of the grade of this Rochester, Monday, and Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, at parts of it didn't actually see track. In 1872 or 73, track was laid from 
The point on the Erie Railroad, which today is just uh, east of Dalton, it was called Ross's. Okay, it's, it's, it's nothing today but just a place along the track. It's, it's between Monday, or excuse me, between Dalton and Swains. And the uh, track was laid and, and the line came up, wiggled around to over the hills, through Nunday, through Tuscarora, and uh, at Sanye, it connected with this other railroad we've already mentioned, this Erie and Genesee Valley, which was the branch from, of the Erie, which was heading south from Mount Morris on its way to Danzo. So it linked up with two viable railroads, and actually was in operation for about five months. Uh, there's a record of the ball with locomotive works of a, of a locomotive of this sort, a 440 American style. It was named the F.D. Lake after a prominent Monday hardware merchant. It was delivered to the line at, at Ross's, and it was actually used for seven or eight months on the railroad, mostly construction trains. Uh, there was probably a little freight business, but it ended up being repossessed very swiftly. There was just no prospects at all for this little railroad at all. In 1874, they thought they might have hit upon something, because that was the year that the Erie Trestle at Lecherick Park, well, it wasn't Lecherick Park then, but it was at the High Falls. The Erie Trestle burned up. It was originally a wooden trestle, and it burned, burned away to nothing. But um, they thought, well, maybe the Erie would need to use our railroad, they could use our railroad to divert off its main line, you know, as part of a detour route on its way to Buffalo while the line was closed. But amazingly, the line was closed for only 47 days. In 47 days, they had a new steel bridge built up and running, which today is kind of amazing. It would take more than 47 days to do that. <laughs> See your paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> and there was suspicion that maybe the railroad, you know, burned the bridge down for its insurance money or something. But actually, the components for the bridge were had been built for, for some place in Russia, and the Erie moved in and out outbid them because they needed them. And even at this time in history, things like that were you know, sta sort of standardized. So I think I don't think there was anything really uh, that suspicious there. But the railroad was able to. You know, a crucial piece of infrastructure like that, it was able to build in a month and a half, even though, well, you can see by the bridge of wet. <coughs> so that, that was the last chance of hope for the Russians to come to the Pennsylvania Railroad. It just went belly up and sat there abandoned, sat there abandoned for eight years. There's a story of the old Monday News where a farmer pulled up the rails across the property and sold them to the Silver Lake Railroad because this thing isn't being used at next <laughs> So it's that. Thing. But now there are other developments happening because in 1878, New York State abandoned the Genesee Valley Canal. So here again, we have a case of communities needing some sort of consolation. So the, the state felt, well, we will sell this property cheap to someone who'd be willing to build a railroad on the towpath. And in that way, these communities have lost the canal would at least be compensated and have a new form of transportation. So uh, there was actually. There was, a, there was an intermediate property owner, a speculator, who made quite a bit of money. But eventually, by 1880, the canal towpath had come into the possession of a syndicate based in Philadelphia, uh, the Seligman Syndicate, that um, was building, had been involved in building of a nickel plate railroad and intended to build a whole system of rails throughout western New York and Pennsylvania under the name of the Buffalo, New York, and Philadelphia. That was, that was the original name. So, they also, this group also, for peanuts, was able to pick up this abandoned property of the Rochester Nunday and Pennsylvania Railroad for what it was worth because it was sitting there. But uh, one reason they wanted it was while well, they were building on the towpath, they were building a railroad, and from a point north of Nunday all the way to Sanye, this railroad already existed. So we'll incorporate that into the Genesee Valley Canal Railroad. So from 1881 to 1882, tracks are being basically laid on the, on the towpath of the canal. It was a relatively easy job to throw down a little gravel and put the tracks up because, you know, the, the towpath provided a pretty good, well-drained pivot and ballasted bed anyways that, that, uh, that they could use. So the thing twisted like crazy. In fact, I guess it was called the pigtail later, wasn't it? Built it, 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 it wasn't built as a railroad. It was built as a canal. And boats obviously can turn, turn more sharper than, than train cars. But, uh, that's what they did. They used the uh, canal towpath for most of the route. This line, as I mentioned earlier, came up from the Olean area up the Genesee Valley and uh, actually crossed the Genesee River using the abutments of the uh, canal viaduct. And those abutments are still in place. You can see that in Portageville. Came through Lecherick Park, went under the Lecherick Trestle, and skirted the grade 
uh, skirted the gorge, um, skirted the gorge, went into the deep cut through Nunday, Tuscarora. Um, but it, it was an interesting issue here because when the railroad went through Nunday, there was a problem because the canal, for those of you who are familiar with the canal, makes a sudden drop down to the valley. There's a whole series of, uh, there's a whole, whole series of, um, what are they called? Locks. 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 Yes, locks where the canal just drops down. When you're engineering a railroad, it's not practical to make the track suddenly drop. <laughs> so they said, we're not going to go through the village of Nunday. We can't do it. We're going to skirt the hillside and pick, pick the railroad up north of Nunday. Well, this created a lot of turmoil in Nunday, but wait a minute, we were supposed to get a railroad. Now, all we got is this rusty set of rails here that, that closed up five years ago, and we bonded ourselves $75,000 for that. Now, the state sold the canal property. And uh, we still don't have a railroad. Uh, they, they got a station they called West Dundee, which was two miles out of town. You had to take a stagecoach to get to. So Dundee still didn't have a railroad, and they were ticked off. Um, uh, I used to work for um, Don Sanders. Actually, his grandfather was among the prominent people who went, took a delegation to, to Albany to, to complain about this. But there was not too much they could do. The railroad people said, look, you know, we're not going to put you on the main line. The one thing they did do was they opened up the old railroad and they incorporated the section from where they linked on to, where they linked on from the canal path that was north of Nunday. It didn't really have any name at the time. It eventually became known as Nunday Junction. They linked there and they used this as part, of, they incorporated this into their Rochester branch. So from this point, Nunday Junction to Sanye, that is the old Rochester Nunday Pennsylvania Railroad. It still is today. And the Greenway is that today, and if, if, if we look, it does not actually follow the canal towpath there. It's near the canal, but it's it's not part of the canal because it was this original earlier railroad. Now, the Rochester Nunday Bay of Pennsylvania are also provided branch south down into Nunday. So this syndicate at the time said, well, we can probably take care of Nunday. We'll, we'll open up the railroad and we'll build it not only to Ross, but we're actually going to build it all the way to Swains, which they did. Now, something else was going on at this time down in Allegheny County, and that was the discovery of oil. And there was a great complex of narrow gauge railroads being built in the early 1880s. These were actually smaller, but they were cheaper to build, more, more of a temporary nature. So, the syndicate happened to own uh, these narrow gauge railroads, and one narrow gauge was built using the now, if you remember, I mentioned that this railroad had been graded from Belvedere all the way north to uh, Sanye. Well, they used this existing grade for a narrow gauge railroad, which actually originated in the uh, Allegheny County oil fields near Bolivar, came up through Friendship, linked down to this grade of Belvedere, and ran a narrow gauge railroad all the way up to Swain. So, in a sense, there was now a continuous railroad through Nunday, as was originally intended. It linked to Nunday Junction with a new line being built to Rochester and linked the swings with a narrow gauge. So, in 1882, this whole complex opened up under this name Buffalo, New York, and Philadelphia. And they were happy for a while because Nunday had a railroad and regular scheduled trains and everything, but very soon it became evident that it wasn't, there wasn't any business on this branch. So, the upshot is it would be abandoned in 1906 and still end up being just a dead-end spur into Nunday. And for Nunday, it was always kind of a civic disgrace, even into the 1930s and 40s, because the passenger trains backed in, backed in from Nunday Junction. <laughs> but uh, beside that, so the Pennsylvania Railroad was pretty much established as the system you see there on, I think, page two of your map. <coughs> its, its prominence in Livingston County was too. It was a branch into Rochester and uh, with a branch now we'll, we'll touch upon some of the other uh, the other lines of Livingston County here. The, the Pennsylvania and the Erie are the two down at once. In 1882, 1881-82, there was another phase of railroad building going on throughout the nation. The financial circumstances became ripe for this, and so we would see a new set of competing main lines being built sort of uh, in competition with the primary players we mentioned before. One of these was the New York, West Shore, and Buffalo Railroad. It missed Livingston County, but it um, was built sort of almost a shadow in the, in, the, uh, in the path of the original New York Central Railroad. And um, not surprising, the New York Central bought it out. And uh, so 
there was uh, see, yeah, then there was the Lehigh Valley Railroad, which existed as a coal mining railroad in the uh, anthracite area of Pennsylvania. But this time they had grander aspirations. They built the main line into Buffalo. This was also built parallel north and then west, parallel pretty much to the old New York Central, and it uh, it did touch upon Livingston County in the northwest northwest corner. It was place which eventually be called P and L Junction. So this was the second second main line. Um, probably the uh, most important railroad that was built at this stage, though, and the one that impacted Livingston County most was the. Uh, New York, Lackawanna, and Western, basically a Western extension of the Lackawanna Railroad, from, which was another anthracite carrier, which had reached Binghamton. And uh, so in the, eight, the early 1880s, they were building their own line, too. And this is the line that came through Livingston County. It, it, at one point, it followed pretty much the Buffalo and Cohoctus Valley up as far as Wayland. But at that point, it departed, skirted Dansville Hill, uh, Eventually, at a, a division point, which would be Groveland Station, came through the village of Mount Morris and uh, on through Gregsville and then westward. So, this was the Lackawanna main line at one time. Um, in its day, it was a very high grade main line, double track, and uh, it served Mount Morris and had a station on the hill in Dansville here. So, it was another very predominant railroad in Livingston County. Um, there's, oh, there's probably one more we should touch upon, too, and I guess I have to backtrack to mention this. It's, it is peripheral that uh, the New York Central, a branch of the New York Central called the Peanut Line, was built from Canada to Niagara Falls, and this is, uh, is in the 1850s. Uh, this was through Rush, and uh, it did touch upon Livingston County, and then it came through Caledonia on its way to, on its way westward. <coughs> we have the Peanut Line there, too. And, this pretty much completes the constellation of railroads in Livingston County. They were all in place by 1892 to 1895. Now, there was one other railroad that was built to connect with all these because they wanted to market salt. Salt was a major commodity here. There were actually salt mines in Livonia, but uh, by the 1890s, the main place to mine salt had been sort of consolidated in Red Sox. So the idea was we want to, um, like one reason Red Sox was chosen was it was a good point where you connect with all the railroads easily. So uh, what was called the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad, also owned by the salt mining interest, was built originally from a mine in Redsaw to a point on the Pennsylvania Railroad up the hill. And then also it could reach this new, uh, this new branch of the Lackawanna we mentioned, which was just a stone's throw away built to the west in Gregsville. So the original Genesee on uh, Wyoming Railroad Wyoming Valley Railroad was basically just a switching line from the salt mine eastward to the Pennsylvania track and westward to the Lackawanna. Now, by building just 11 miles more to the north, they could hit a point which was just west of Caledonia and connect with four other railroads, which is just what they did. Um, if you look at the map on the back page, you can see the Tennessee Wyoming line. The Red Sox is the line which is dotted there because the map is built after the Pennsylvania was abandoned, but you'll see the line built to the Pennsylvania Railroad to the east, the line to the Lackawanna Railroad to the west, that was the Lackawanna and West Railroad. <coughs> the Genesee and Wyoming Valley Railroad itself heads northward to a connection with four other railroads, the Erie, the New York Central Peanut Line, and the Baltimore and Ohio, and the Lehigh Valley. Reminds me, there is one more railroad we've got to mention, that is Baltimore and Ohio. Almost didn't make Livingston County, but it does catch that southwest corner. It was originally, this railroad was built in the 1870s as the um, Rochester and State Line from Rochester to Salamanca. And they, like I said, it caught that southwestern corner of Livingston County, went through Caledonia, basically. And it eventually evolved into a railroad called the Rochester and Pittsburgh, and then the Buffalo of Rochester and Pittsburgh. It didn't become part of the uh, Baltimore, Ohio system until the 1930s, 1932, I believe. So that's uh, that's that's a rare. And I think a good way of concluding that is to look at the Genesee, Wyoming, which was built as sort of a strategic connection to all the lines, all six railroads which were in Livingston County. And uh, one more we probably should mention, which uh, deserves a very brief mention because it was uh, sort of a minor railroad. This is the Honeyway Falls and Lima Railroad. 
Um, aside from narrow gauges, there was another kind of railroad being built called the interurban. And this was basically a railroad with a catenary following the track where the locomotives were powered with electricity. It's primarily for passenger service. The locomotives were lightweight, and the track was lightweight. And, and um, they were like basically large trolley cars. And a, and a line was built from uh, <clears throat> south from Honeyway Falls to Lima with one of these interurban rail, assuming they could tap traffic there and actually looking for recreational use on, on excuse me, on Hemlock Lake. You now, people wonder what, what kind of recreation would there be on Hemlock Lake? Well, in the 19th century, Hemlock Lake was covered with cottages. And in fact, the Lehigh Valley Railroad at the same time, you know, they had just built westward about 1890, they looked to covet some of this uh, recreational traffic on Hemlock Lake, just as the Erie had built the branch down to uh, Canisius Lake. And they, in fact, did build a, a branch of their railroad from through Honeyway Falls, through uh, Livonia Center, right down into Hemlock, right onto the lake. And the Honey Falls and Lima Railroad had the same aspirations. They got as far as Lima, and when a great deal of contention erupted, actually, between the Lehigh Valley Railroad and the city of Rochester, because Rochester says, wait a minute, we're using this for our water reservoir, we're going to kick everybody off here. And the well, <laughs> railroad wasn't too happy with that because they figured, well, you know, <laughs> we have, you know, we have a lot of business plans here. And there were some very interesting lawsuits that went on. Basically enough, the city of Rochester won, probably because it had the more, you know, it had some powerful financial resources. I often wonder what would happen if uh, the villages of Geneseo and Livonia had gotten the same idea at the same time and decided to remove everybody off Canisius Lake. What a different history we would have had. <laughs> I don't think those villages had the financial resources that the city of Rochester did that they could have attempted something like that. Although, I suppose the justification of the lake as a water reservoir was the same idea. But the railroad was certainly on the side of business and one that would hope to, uh, you know, hope to keep that open and would love to see Hemlock Lake filled with cottages too. So, what we had was a branch of Lehigh Valley Railroad that actually stayed in Hemlock but never did much business. And, uh, and, the, and also this little parallel Lyman Honeyway Falls Electric Railroad, which would go belly up very soon, just before World War II, it, it went out of business and the tracks were torn up. So now I guess we'll turn to the abandonments because that's the final stage here. The rail system remained intact and quite healthy right up through the Depression era, although the Depression was very rough because by that time highway traffic was infringing on the railroad business, especially the passenger business. And, uh, there was the general decline in the economy itself. The first significant abandonment we have probably for Livingston County took place not so much because of loss of business, because of a competing situation. Remember I described the Lackawanna Railroad coming up through Dansville, Groveman Station, and um, Mount Morris. Well, for, for almost 40 years, this railroad sat within, let me back up here. The Erie, the Erie Railroad in 1890 is the most southern part of its branch. If you talk about coming down through Mount Morris and the Avon, became independent, okay? And it was given the name of its connecting places, the Dansville Mount Morris Railroad. For some reason, the Erie stopped leasing this line and they let it go independent. But basically, it was still a satellite of the Erie because the only connection that Dansville Mount Morris really had was with the Erie parent in Mount Morris. Now what happened was about halfway between Dansville and Mount Morris, the Dansville and Mount Morris Railroad ran within the stone's throw of the Lackawanna at Groveland Station, but they never connected there. The Erie, you know, the Erie always discouraged it. Well, sometime in the 1930s, the decision was made to build a connection with the Lackawanna at Groveland Station. Basically, we're going to short circuit this Erie business. We're going to get most of our business off the of Lackawanna. And sure enough, that's what happened. And it had, it had ramifications for the Erie Line well beyond Dansville because once this connection was made, I believe about 1935, then the Dansville Mount Morris no longer had to go to Mount Morris. The Dansville Mount Morris could go to Groveland Station, connect with the Lackawanna Railroad and do most of its business there. By that time, passengers going from Dansville to Mount Morris were probably almost non-existent. So we're talking basically freight, foster wheeler, and other Dansville industries. So it was all coming in from Groveland Station. The Erie said, now wait a minute, you know, why are we even running this line now? So the Dansville Mount Morris pulled, by 18, in 1938, the Dansville Mount Morris pulled up its line from 
from Rolling Station to Mount Morris. And the area said, well, we don't have any business anymore. Most of that business going south was for Danza. We're pulling up the whole line. And in 1941, this is what happened. And this, so who was victimized by this was not just Mount Morris, but also Geneseo. This was the line, in fact, that, um, that went over the Ashantee Bridge. Okay, and it was also the line that today still exists in the sense that it dead ends at the Kraft General Foods plant. Okay, so one time you imagine the line at the Kraft plant just continuing over the Ashen Chief Bridge, uh, running along the rim of the valley from Geneseo and onto Mount Morris. So this was a victim, even be, just beyond the eve of World War II, the Erie pulled this line out. And uh, it, had, um, it had seen passenger service too. I might mention a little bit about this line. It had, during the interurban era, it was, a, it was, Canton area was built in 1906 to run experimental electric cars on this line. From 1906 to 1927, from the, the section from Rochester to Mount Morris was electrified and they ran these electric passenger, and passenger cars on it. At the same time, still running the steam freight trains for the freight business. It, it turned out to be an unsuccessful experiment. In 1927, it was abandoned. The Canton area was torn up at the, uh, there were little gas electric cars <coughs> used to replace the, uh, the these are self-contained engines, basically, that ran a traction truck. Still, still in a sense, an electric car, but more late along the lines of a diesel with its own self-generating plant. So these cars came onto the Erie for the final phase of passenger service, maybe the last 12 or 15 years. And people, old people, here in Geneseo, even will remember these cars. I don't know if they can, anybody remembers the electric cars, but the gas electric cars still came into Geneseo and, and served, uh, you know, the regular commuter run in the evening from Rochester in the morning going north and the south coming back and uh, making frequent stop, even flight stops. So these, uh, these, these were also victim too. All passenger service was gone from Avon South. The lines stopped, stopped, stopped running. So this was probably the first significant abandonment that Livingston County would see. Um, the next abandonment didn't really come until after World War II. And this was, uh, I think I mentioned early on how the line from up from Wayland to Canisius and, and Livonia had always been doing the secondary status. Well, freight business had declined to the point where there really wasn't anything, any need to, uh, to have this other connection anywhere from down to Corning. So in 1956, the tracks from Livonia southward were torn out. This grade still exists, but uh, the railroad dead ended in Livonia. And uh, this was sort of the complex we've inherited today. Right in the village of Livonia, there was still uh, some feed, feed business and some lumber business in the village itself, so the, the train dead ended there. But basically, that, that was the end of that line. Now, um, most, a lot of the rest of the system remained intact until the Conrail era. In um, 1976, a lot of the railroads were in really bad shape, and uh, they came under the federal government who organized the Conrail system. And uh, under Conrail, there was wholesale abandonments, and Livingston County lost a great deal of trackage. Uh, probably, oh, let me mention one. There was one more abandonment. First, we got to mention that is the Pennsylvania Railroad before Canada. The Pennsylvania line had been, a, you know, had been a reasonably healthy freight line, but uh, in 1963 it had expired too. Uh, and amazingly, today there probably would be a government assistance to keep this line running. But back then, the Pennsylvania just said it isn't economical, even though it had about 35 freight customers between Olean and Rochester. So we're tearing it out. So essentially, that's what happened from a point called Wadsworth Junction which is um, north, north of Livingston County, south of Rochester, all the way down to Olean. The canal line was ripped out and the service there ended too. And it came under the ownership of Rochester Gas and Electric Corporation, who used a lot of the right of way to put in poles. But uh, the, the larger band that came with Conrail saw the end of, uh, oh, no, I guess i got to mention one more here. <laughs> there is another band. And that is, most of you probably remember the Erie Lackawanna Rail. This was a merger of the Erie and Lackawanna, which had been completely <coughs> separate lines for most of the uh, 20th century. Completely independent companies, but they had very parallel tracks. The Erie reached Chicago, the Lackawanna only reached Buffalo. But uh, through much of western New York, the lines were parallel, and as rail business was shrinking, they were they were looking to uh, save money, so they these long, they were 
rivals for many years. They thought they would consolidate and save money. So this had direct impact on Livingston County because they said we don't really need the Lackawanna main line going to Buffalo anymore. Erie has, the Erie has its own main line. So we'll still say some of the secondary trackage, which has business along it, but uh, it won't be a main line anymore. We're going to abandon wholesale chunks of it. So in 19, the, the merger happened in 1960. In 1963, the track was torn up from, uh, we should say, Groveland Station all the way to, to Dansville. If that's a track that you see along Dansville Hill, you can still see the up in the ditch. But that stopped, that was the uh, Lackawanna main line, and that stopped operating in 63. It was taken back all the way to Wayland. Now, Wayland, there was still some business because there was the first industry there. And of course, at uh, Groveland Station, there was still some business because there was uh, business for Foster Wheeler that was being delivered to the Dansville Mount Morris. So, for local traffic, these parts of the Lackawanna main line were kept intact. But from Groveland Station to Wayland, there was nothing along Dansville Hill. It was a steep grade. So, that track was gone. It, it went in 1963. So, that was gone. Now, um, when Conrail came in in 1967, we saw the demise of the Erie Railroad going west out of Ava all the way to, well, Batavia. And in fact, that was, um, that was not a band from Batavia, but all the way to Alexander. There's still a little piece of this line that exists from Attica to Alexander. But, uh, this is the 1977, this Erie line west of Avon was, was gone, and the bridges still exist. In fact, there's talk of using this uh, the bridge the old railroad bridge to bring a, a branch of the Genesee Valley Canal into the village of Avon. You can still see the bridge if you want to drive up River Road by the Avon Super Plant there. But that line went, um, and uh, shortly thereafter, a chunk of the, another chunk of the Lackawanna went too, which was uh, west from Gregsville originally. Um, actually, not until 1980, because Conrail did use some of this line. Bill had actually a locomotive engineer on this line, hauling salt into uh, her hauling salt cars to the mine and loaded cars out, it would come in, um, I guess, from <coughs> Alexander, right, Bill? Yeah, it would come off the uh, right. Attica Alexander branch. From the three miles out uh, North Alexander, we come out of our old old Delaware Lackawanna. Yeah, the old Lackawanna, they take you to Gregsville, and towards Gregsville, there was the connection with the, uh, the, the, you know, the old connection with the salt mine. But uh, he, with, um, with Conrail, even this one would go eventually. And, uh, so I think that kind of brings us to the, the constellation of lines we have today. Um, you might mention one significant addition, which you're probably all aware of, and that is uh, when the, uh, the old salt mine collapsed, of course, the new one was built at Hampton's Corners. We needed about a mile and a half of track to be built to that line. Unfortunately, uh, much of the main line of the Lackawanna was still preserved. It was preserved from Gregsville to Groveland Station. And because that was in place, uh, and actually by this time it come under the manager of the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad, the Genesee and Wyoming had access to Hampton's Corners by just building a mere two miles across the Myron Brady's cornfield. So uh, it was fortunate that that line exists. Um, the rest of the Lackawanna does, of course, still exist down to uh, Grove and Groveland Station and the, and the, the piece of the dance with Mount Morris, although that has really seen almost no traffic for the last Ten years, Foster Wheelers have been closed now for about a year, but uh, in the last ten years of its existence, Foster Wheelers uh, utilized very little rail service. Uh, so the main, um, I guess the, the most significant success story for Livingston County, though, has been the L.A. and L. Railroad. The, um, the Erie Lackawanna in 1964 is getting ready to abandon the last piece of this Buffalo Corning in New York. We mentioned how in 1956 it had been and southward all the way to Corning. And uh, by the, there was very little business in Livonia. There were still some in Abbott, but uh, it was mostly Crash General Foods. But the idea was, well, we're going to tear off the track from Livonia to Abbott because it just isn't worth maintaining with a feed mill there or anything. So local interests got together, bought the line. I can remember this myself because my, my grandfather bought me a share of stock in it. And said, well, let's save the railroad. You know, it's, aside from the economics, it was a sentimental thing. And the Livonia Avon Lake Railroad was organized around this plan. And uh, it was a pretty short railroad. It ran from Livonia to Avon in Lakeville, just like its name said. This branch we mentioned at that time, the engine house was in Lakeville. And 
it was just sort of a fly-by-night operation. What are we going to do? We have just a, a lumber yard and feed mill. I mean, we can't make any money. So somebody hit upon the idea, well, our Kate Attic over in Omi County runs passenger excursions. Why don't we buy ourselves a steam engine and uh, run some passenger excursions? And sure enough, that's what they did. I believe it was 1970. <coughs> well, 64 they started. They started in 64, originally with a, a small diesel. Uh, they, they bought off the RGD plant down on Rochester, but very soon there was a passenger excursion in for, uh, I think, into 1983. Had, Livonia had a regular passenger business, and it uh, wouldn't be wonderful if Livonia still had this today, but uh, because of the insurance crisis in the mid 80s, my understanding was a small grade crossing accident, and um, the railroad decided to get rid of the passenger service, but something very significant had happened in between, and that is in the late 70s. The sweetener, the blending plants are located in Lakeville, and all of a sudden, the Livonia have on Lakeville Railroad was back in the business being a real railroad because they they used quite a large number of freight cars, up to 20 to 30 freight cars a week, and now uh, that number is even bigger today. So all of a sudden, they had some legitimate freight business delivering freight cars into Lakeville. So they weren't really interested in being a hokey little passenger steers railroad anymore, I guess. <laughs> And their insurance problem. So all of a sudden, the Livonia have on Lake Carrera went from being a finite operation to a you know to a solid short line business, which it is today. And eventually, the Livonia have on Lake Carrera would purchase other properties in, in Ontario County, and perhaps most significantly, they would purchase the line northward into Rochester, the old Erie line, the one that mixed Rochester and Genesee Valley. So basically, they own not only uh, they took over the Avon switching and and all the way into uh, Rochester to Genesee Junction, which is what the railroad has today. So that's, uh, there are really two railroad success stories here in Livingston County. The second one being, of course, the reopening of the mine and the immense business that, that's there today. So what we have today is this uh, prosperous l and l short line. It terminates in Lakeville. Um, in 1980, without the passenger service and with no business, there was no reason to leave the line intact into the village of Livonia. So the line from Livonia to um, Bronson Hill Road, basically, almost to the Canisius Lake Junction, was torn out. And uh, from Lakeville North into Rochester, we have a prosperous little short line railroad. Um, we also have Genesee, Wyoming, which never has gone away. It went through hard times in the mid in, uh, in the mid 90s there with the collapse of the salt mine, but uh, fortunately survived and now is serving the new mine as healthy as ever. Um, we have the old line which sits idle today, running from Mount Morris to Dansville too. And um, let's see, I think we, we touched it. P and L Junction, which is the northern terminus of the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad today. The Lehigh Valley Railroad is gone. The New York Central is gone. The Erie is gone. But the original railroad, which, which is the Ruff, Buffalo, Rochester, and Pittsburgh, later on in the 1930s to become part of the Baltimore and Ohio, took another change in 1986. Genesee and Wyoming actually purchased the line and uh, named it the Rochester and Southern. And uh, at the time, it extended almost all the way to Pittsburgh. Uh, in, in the early 90s, the section was abandoned, so now the line only goes to Silver Springs, basically. But uh, this is the, in Silver Springs to Rochester, this is the salt mine's primary outlet to Rochester through this old b and track at P&L Junction. Of course, the trains are operated continuously now right from the mine into Goodman Street Yard in Rochester using the original Genesee Valley and uh, this Baltimore and Ohio trackage. They're also operated from the junction of P&L southward to a connection with the Norfolk Southern Railroad and Silver Springs. So um, that's, uh, that's still a lot of railroad business for Livingston County today. So I guess we're going to close this part of the presentation and get down to the slide program now, but I'll, I'll open uh, <coughs> the floor up to questions if anybody has any at all about uh, anything we talked about here. Yes. Could you enlighten us a little bit about why the Erie Lackawanna was also called the Delaware Lackawanna in Western? Okay, the original company, the 1882 company that we mentioned built through here, was the Delaware Lackawanna in Western, okay? Sometimes just called the Lackawanna for short. There's the DL and W. This was the line that we mentioned came in from Buffalo through Great, through Livingston County, went through Gregsville, Mount Morris, uh, Groveland Station, skirted Groveland Hill. Okay, that was the Lackawanna. Now, the Erie Lackawanna didn't exist till 1960, when the Erie, the entire Erie Railroad merged with the Delaware Lackawanna and Western. 
So from 1960 on, there were properties which had a legacy of either being Erie or Lackawanna, became the Erie Lackawanna. Okay, so, and, and in fact, they, they changed their paint scheme. The Erie engines were black and yellow, the diesel, the, um, they had a maroon paint scheme for the Erie Lackawanna, which maybe you remember. And the Erie Lackawanna existed from basically 1960 till 1976 when it emerged, you know, was uh, sort of the Conrad. Yes? As for its name, though, it had a story where it came around the of the Delaware River through the Delaware Water Gap into the Lackawanna, through the Lackawanna Valley into western New York. But that was, that was a story and the basic for its name yeah. was there. Yeah, and that's part of the name. Yeah, the Lackawanna River originally is called the Lackawanna because it came out of the Lackawanna Valley in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And, that has a, and that has a very old history, which we didn't go into. It goes back to the, it's an anthracite carrier in the 1850s. They were, they had established themselves to back to, to be powerful to the point where they could afford to build their own line from Binghamton to Buffalo, which is what they did, which is why, of course, we, we saw that line here. The Lackawanna in its day was one of the highest, considered one of the highest, best run railroads in the in the United States, even though it was a relatively short railroad from uh, from uh, Scranton to Buffalo, it was uh, you know in, well New York City they had a terminus in New Jersey. But Phoebe Snow was a high class passenger train. The ballast <coughs> and the trackage were, were meticulously kept, and it was, it was quite an impressive railroad. But they had uh, World War One and World War Two. They said it was one of the main supply routes from the Great Lakes to the New York Harbor, and the Lackawanna was uh, the heaviest road bed. Well, they used to refer to it in the road bed itself in the nation. Uh, and World War II, like the bridge in Mount Marsh, they had sentries on that from the end to the center. I've seen pictures of that because it was such a military supply route right. in the early days of World War One and the early days of World War II. With a buck New York Harbor and a buck of right. And the piece that survives today is still taking those heavy salt cars, and that is the part from Hampton's Corners to. Uh, you know, from Hampton's quarters to Gregsville, those all, that salt was still traveling on the old Lackawanna main line. Would you say that for most of us here, that maybe the DLMW was the most significant uh, trackage uh, from, say, the, well, the 30s through uh, the 60s? It uh, depends on where you lived. Obviously, if you were in Avon, it was the Erie Railroad, because the Erie had four branches coming in and out. But I think um, as far as mainline traffic went, well, we had, like I said, in the, in the corner there, we had the Lehigh Valley Railroad. There were, um, the, maybe the way to put this is the, uh, the double track main line, the heavily trafficked main line that Livingston County, that was predominantly Livingston County, was the Lackawanna. We caught a, we had a little piece of the Erie there in the, in the southwest corner and a little piece of the Lehigh Valley in the northwest corner. But the only uh, double track, yeah, heavily trafficked main line that went right through Livingston County was the Lackawanna. Yes. I, can, I can well remember having lived for my first eight years of life in Linwood. The, the troop trains and, uh, and all the military equipment that was yeah, going it through. Yeah, it was a busy double two. track railroad. And yes. the track passenger trains that uh, used to run through there. Yeah, well, Bill started his career as a fireman in the back. I uh, started, yeah, that's right. I started on the, actually started on the Pennsylvania. But I I, I worked for the Lackawanna, the L and W Railroad uh, for five years prior to the merger in 19, I worked from 1955 to 1960. I worked on the helper engines at Groveland. All the freight trains had to stop at Groveland, get a helper engine to go up over Groveland Hill. And as you went up over the hill, you looked right down into the valley, and you could see Dansville and all those little towns down in there. Uh, that the DLNW never actually went into Dansville. It went on the side hill of Dansville. We would get up to Wayland, and it would cut the, the uh, flagman would come out on the caboose, he would pull a pin, he would cut the uh, engine off, we would go on an emergency stop, <coughs> and change ends, and go back to Groveland for a second push. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there's no more questions, uh, I guess we can start the slide program. Well, thank you, Howard. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Draw your attention to uh, Howard, his presentation. I don't want to get in, uh, involved with what he said. I, what I'm going to do is take it on from, say, the 1970s from the 1930s. He mentioned the electrification of the Erie Railroad from Rochester to Mount Morris. We had a, uh, a number of photographers in the Rochester area who took 
Fortunately, back in the 1930s, in 1934 and 1935, took photographs of those electric cars. One of the photographs that I have, uh, one of the slides that I have today, is a builder's photo of one of those uh, Pullman built uh, electric cars. And I'm going to show that the first part of the program is going to be on there. It's going to be kind of a four part program. It's going to show the, the first of all, it's going to show those gas electric cars that Howard referred to. It's going to show uh, a picture here in, uh, in Geneseo of the depot. It's going to show some of the Livonia Avon and Lakeville and some of Conrail. Conrail operated the railroad after the Erie Lackawanna was taken over in 1976 from Rochester to Avon. Uh, I've got some slides of that and I want to uh, do the Erie first and then I'm going to do a selection on the Pennsylvania Railroad. We're going to do a selection on the Genesee and Wyoming uh, back in the bicentennial year of 1976 and we're going to do something on the, on the couple of miscellaneous. So if you're how are we going This is one of the original uh, electric cars that, uh, when the Erie electrified between uh, 1906. They copied these from a series of cars down in the New York City area. There was a sus uh, an, uh, electric, uh, there was a third rail operation actually. They merely put pantograph, which is similar to trolley poles, on these cars and they could run these in multiple unit. They had a, a jumper cables between if they were running more than one car, they could uh, uh, use these as a two or three car train. Most of the time they were generally used as a two car train. Here's a, 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 lay, here's a, a version of one of the trailers that was used on the, uh, this is one of these electric trailers that was converted to a gas electric trailer that used to haul these uh, commuter trains between Rochester, Geneseo, and Mont Morris. This is a, a yard, this is a, a scene at, at uh, Rochester Yard. This is a Rochester Yard with a, with a, with a gas electric car and a, 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 a Railway Express mail uh, railway post office car. The further door on, this, on the Railway Express car is a, a, rail, a mail, railroad mail clerk. They sorted mail en route. Behind that was one of the steam engines that uh, were used on the freight trains on this railroad. <coughs> in 1941, at the time that the service was being discontinued, uh, the passenger service between Rochester and Mount Morris, the Rochester chapter of the National Railway Historical Society chartered a gas electric car and a coach to run an excursion over this railroad. Uh, th these are some of the early, I uh, think, the gentleman with a cap, with a hat on, looking towards the coach is the late John Woodbury. John Woodbury was one of the uh, original charter members at Rochester Chapter, and I think this was basically one of their first railroad excursions. Okay, here's a, this is Rochester too. This is the, one of the typical gas electric cars that ran in uh, service between Rochester and Mount Morris. So assuming that uh, there was some mechanical problem, the engineer is looking under the traction motor of the lead truck of, his, of the gas electric car with the possibility that, uh, that he may well have some sort of problem. Another, uh, this is the Rochester Depot uh, at the Erie Railroad. This was one of the extra, uh, this was one of the original trolley trailers, electric trailers, but they used this for uh, when they had extra commuter cars, they would ha hook this onto the rear end of a, of a gas electric car. If they needed a, a more room or there was a, 
a, a larger uh, number of people run, riding on the train than uh, would normally ride on it. Gola, G-O-L-A-H. It's up there. I think this is in, I'm not sure that this is Monroe County. It could be Livingston County. Pardon? Monroe. Monroe, okay. It's just a little bit north of industry. This is a, a box car that the Erie Railroad used as a depot. Okay, this is this is Avon. The as, as Howard mentioned, the branch between Avon and Corning. Uh, this this, this uh, gas electric car normally ran six days a week, but it along the railroad between Rochester and Corning, they would stop at uh, two or three locations and carry a milk car or two behind this thing into uh, Corning where. They would set it out, and the uh, yard engine would uh, attach it to the uh, one of the main uh, trains on the Erie. The Erie was noted for all the milk trains they ran. They ran them all over the system. And in fact, at one time, they basically had a milk train out of Hornell that picked up at all kinds of locations along the railroad, and it was a solid uh, milk train into Jersey City, which is right across from New York City. This is the two car, uh, this originally was a, a, a part of the diesel, uh, the uh, electric shop of the Erie Railroad at uh, Avon. And uh, later on it was used, uh, they, they used to service steam engines in here. And I'm almost, I don't, I'm not sure that they ever served any diesel power here. But uh, they did, uh, when the Rochester Corning trains were, or freight trains come in and they had to keep those engines overnight, this was the facility they used. Uh, here's another view of one of those. Uh, they had a couple of those cars, those electric interurban cars that they kept in Rochester. They, uh, one of them, at least, I'm told, was used as a yard office. But I don't know if this was the one or there was two other cars that they used. This is what we'd call a combine. Had the coach seats in the back and a baggage portion in the front. You can see the baggage door on the front end of the car. Uh, let's see, this is the... I, I'm not sure that this isn't... Uh, this is a... Uh, I don't know which depot this is. I don't know what's... Uh, I don't think it's... Uh, the, 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 it's labeled Geneseo, but I don't think it is. I think it's... Uh, it's uh, New York Central Depot at Attica. But anyway, it's a, a, a freight house and a, pass, it's a combination freight and passenger building. Okay. This is over at Livonia. As Howard was telling about the, the branch between Corning and Livonia. During the winter months, especially uh, this particular part of, of, of uh, Stuben County, would, the, the rails would load up with, with snow, and uh, this was taken out of the cab, heading north, uh, uh, somewhere up north of Bath towards, uh, towards uh, Avon, and uh, we, two 1,200-class uh, uh, GP9s were shoving this snow, and it's a wonder we didn't go off the track. This is a snowplow. This is that. This was this uh, photograph was taken at Livonia. This was a snowplow extra. Uh, this was a Russell snowplow, and of course one of the four mentioned 1200s. No, that's I'm sorry. That's one of the Baldwin engines. That's not a. That's not a, a 1200. That's a Baldwin engine. Uh, notice the, the train order board behind the locomotive. If those uh, uh, the deep, uh, the depot is just the other side of the uh, of where the unit is. <coughs> I mentioned before about the gas electric car between Rochester and uh, uh, Corning. This photograph here was taken in Bath. They stopped, the, the, the brakeman is looking at a car they're going to pick up uh, and bring down to Corning. It was supposed to have been a uh, milk car, but this day there was no milk car ready, so this freight car was ready to go, so they just tacked that onto the rear of the gas electric and away they went. The gas electrics uh, had a predominant name, Hoodlebugs. Everybody called them a 
Their nickname was Hoodlebart. And uh, you're going to see an interesting one as we go along here, down on the Dansville Mount Morris. Here's the same train. Now he's got, uh, this is a different day, but he's got an express car uh, on the rear end of the train. This photograph was taken at Bath. They connected with the Bath and Hammonds port at Bath. Uh, the Delaware Lackawanna was on the other side of the, uh, the Bath and Hammonds port at that location, never connected, and this was prior, this was Erie, this was prior to the merger of 1960. So both railroads up until 1960 were running parallel to each other. Okay, 1995, the, the Binghamton uh, Division of the Railway Enthusiasts chartered a special train on the Bath and Hammonds Fort, an excursion, a rail fan excursion. We covered the entire railroad at that time was, was from Bath north, uh, north to uh, Hammonds Fort, back to Bath, and up to Cahoxton. Now the railroad from uh, Cahoxton to Wayland was still in, but it wasn't in service. And uh, the Bath and Hammonds Fort had two of these Alco uh, S2 locomotives, and they, they kept them at Bath, and at least in the later years, and uh, they used them. Uh, there was the, the big business after the Taylor Wine closed at Hammondsport was up at Cahokton. There was a big feed mill up there, and basically that was the main source of revenue for the Bath and Hammondsport. But of course, later years after the uh, Bath and Hammondsport was a able to lease the railroad from Bath down to, uh, almost in the Corning, uh, more business. Uh, opened up for them at, at Wayland, and some of, there was a gas storage business at Bath, and that uh, 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 brought in uh, more, uh, their car, that brought their car loanings up. We should mention that is an operating by the Livonia Evan Lake Railroad. Yeah. 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 yeah, you're right. This is a night locomotive, 1936. This is a, 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 a Conrail locomotive at Avon. I ran that same locomotive very various locations on the railroad. I ran it out of Geneva. I ran it out of Niagara Falls, the same engine. Everywhere I'd go, the 1936 would show up. <laughs> but it, it was just like following me around. I ran it when uh, I, I worked between Rochester uh, and uh, Kodak on the, on the second belt. I, I, I used it on the... Uh, between uh, Geneva and Canandaigua and between Geneva and Auburn. And I, I worked on it between Niagara Falls and uh, Lockport. This is, uh, and I have on again, this is, these are cars that they're going to, uh, that uh, Conville is going to interchange with the Livonia Avenue and Lakeville. These, uh, I assume, were uh, uh, sugar cars, raw sugar in those cars. They, 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 would, they brought these down from Genesee's Junction. They were going to drop them off, and the L.A. and L. would pick them up and uh, take them down to Lakeville. It's probably vegetable oil. Huh? It's probably vegetable oil. Probably. For food, for craft, Here's another view at uh, uh, the uh, same uh, day at uh, Avon. This was uh, the... Uh, a, a few slides of the first L.A. and L. train to run north of Avon to, to Genesee Junction, and uh, this was the the first trip that they uh, that they uh, they made uh, on the L, uh, as part of the L.A. and L. They had the 420 and the 425 on there. Here's another. Uh, we were the same train. I don't know how many cars he had that day. I I counted them, but. Uh, I, did, I don't remember how many cars. I did a, good, a fairly decent consist. This is the same day. Uh, I, think, I think we had an overcast that day, or part of it anyway. This is up towards Rochester. I don't rightly know what road, or what grade or road crossing this was, but I just followed the train. I, I'm not that familiar with Rochester. Okay, this is up there near Genesee Junction. 
and I'm sitting in a parking lot behind some supermarket around this big curve, and uh, here comes this L.A. and L freight train. I think uh, Pete Swanson or somebody was chasing, tagging along, or I was tagging along after him. I don't remember, but it was quite an eventful day. Now this is up near a uh, Avon again, and uh, these are not in direct order. I wish they were, but unfortunately they're not. Okay, this is the, the LA and L going by Industry Station. Industry Station, by the way, is part of the National Railway Historical Society Museum. In fact, there's two museums there. Uh, one is the New York State Transportation Museum, which is basically electric uh, trolley uh, museum, and of course the museum in industry <coughs> is basically a railroad museum. But there is a short two-mile piece of railroad between the two museums. And for a while they were using track uh, motor cars to run people from one museum to the other. I don't know what the situation is up there now. I haven't been up there in uh, probably a year or two. This is, uh, this, uh, this is some switching operation at Avon. They changed ends to do this. Uh, I, I, this may have been going into craft, I'm not sure. This is under, this is Avon uh, heading up towards Rochester, the 420 and the 425. <coughs> there was quite a few people chasing that train that day. And I, I don't know how many of us, but there was a, a number of us. This is a very poor excuse of a slide, but that's the way it happens. Those things happen. Now the, now the uh, this slide here depicts the Dansville Mont Morris, showing it from Mont Morris down to Saunier and down to Dansville. Groveland is not shown on that map. Uh, as, as Howard expressed, it was a later connection that was made at Groveland. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, I worked out of Groveland when uh, I worked on the helper engines going up Wayland Hill. But uh, some of these uh, Dansville Mount Morris slides are rather old, but uh, I'm going to depict them as I see them. This is the uh, Mr. Hart down there in, in Dansville who was the president of this railroad. He stopped there one day, and I, I asked him if I could look into the station. And this was after the railroad was torn up. And he said, would you like a souvenir? And I said, yes, I would. So he hands me this Dansville Mount Morris Pass. And uh, I made a slide out of it. And uh, we had, uh, I still got the, I've still got the pass in my ticket collection. This is one of the earlier engines on the Dansville Mount Morris, the origin of which I don't know. This is a, mo uh, a, a 10 wheeler, a 460. I do not know the origin of this locomotive. I wish I did. Uh, but the other, the next two locomotives, I do know the origin of. I was telling you about the hurdle bug. Believe it or not, this handled U.S. Mail, Railway Express, passengers, uh, and baggage between Dansville and Mount Morris. At one time, the Erie ran a through passenger train service from Rochester to Dansville, and vice versa. But in later years, they cut back to Mont Morris, and the, the Danzel Mont Morris run this rail bus thing. It had a, I think it had a Mac engine in it uh, for the 14-mile distance between uh, Danzel and Mont Morris. The 304 was an engine that originally came off of the uh, Akron, Canton, and Youngstown Railroad. Can you give us the years? Huh? Can you give us the years the engines were built, to your best recollection? Well, I think those were built about 1912, 1910 or 1912. Uh, they had uh, one engine that came off the Akron, Canton, and Youngstown, and the other engine came off the Del Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Now, this is a very, this is the pit where they 
drop the fire in, in, uh, on the engine. They open uh, when they clean the fire. They drop it down into the pit, and then they would scoop it out of the pit into a into a into a flat or a, a gondola. This is at Dansville also. So this, don't one of these switches exist up today? Pardon? Did one of those engines go to Steamtown? Both of them are Steamtown now. Oh, both are Steamtown. Yeah. The 304 went. Originally, it went up to uh, Steamtown in Vermont, uh, and uh, then from Vermont it went to uh, Steamtown in Scranton, where it's uh, it, it's down there along with the, the 565 is down there also. Now this 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 is when it was up in Vermont, <coughs> after after the Dansville Mount Morris bought their first diesel. They actually had two diesels, but diesel number one. I was in a service by itself for almost 10 or 12 years before they brought the second diesel. And then they, when the Dansville, uh, Dansville Mount Morris was taken over by the Genesee in Wyoming, they shipped them to grow, uh, to uh, Gretzoff. And eventually they went to a, a railroad called the Bay Colony up in Massachusetts. And I think there's both of them up in Massachusetts to this day. But this engine here is now at Steamtown in Scranton. Along with this engine, this is the one I, I mentioned that belongs to the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. Uh, they all, used to alternate these. They'd run one for a year, and then they'd uh, to kill the fire, and they'd run the other one for a year. They tried to maximize the uh, the uh, use of the engine, and uh, they uh, this engine. Uh, they kept this engine for a short period after they bought their first diesel, and then it went eventually to uh, Steamtown, and then it wound up in Scranton, along with the sister engine 304. This is this, this uh, 565. That was the DL and W engine, Lackawanna engine, yeah. Yeah. No, the G and W, no, they never used that engine. That went in, they went into uh, before the that was gone before the G and W acquired the Dansville Mount Morris. The Dansville Mount Morris actually donated that. Uh, the Hart family donated that <coughs> steam helm. Here's the front end of that picture. No, notice the snowplow. That was the only snowplow they had in the whole railroad. It was right on the front end of that 565. I don't think they had one on the 304. No, nope, they didn't. This is another view at Dansville. Uh, evidently, they're uh, making up a, tr a short train to go to Groveland. When I was working on the pusher engines at Groveland, uh, a lot of times about noon, uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, they'd come over with their train and they would park it uh, on, on the on the Y, one leg of the Y. They'd go around the other leg of the Y, back down on the interchange track, pick up the cars that the Lackawanna local left and they'd leave to go back to uh, Danville. Most of the time that I worked down there, the 565 was the, was the regular engine. Okay, as Howard mentioned, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, the Rochester and Nunday in Pennsylvania, notice that from Belvedere up to Swains. Also notice the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, out of Cuba Junction up to Belfast and then up the river, uh, uh, up to Portage. Well, okay, this is supposedly, I don't know what year this map is. I never could find out. But basically it shows uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad. I'm going to, uh, let's see what's the next set. Oh, I, okay. Before I go into Pennsylvania, this is one of the Dansville Mount Morris engines taken over by the Genesee in Wyoming after they, they bought the railroad. And it was it set in, uh, in uh, Gretzoff until they finally was able to sell it. And uh, those 44-ton locomotives were primarily used on short-line railroads, and they were primarily used where uh, light rail was and light traffic. They could probably haul two or three loads at, at the most. Now. We, as Howard mentioned, Gregsville. This is a very, this is a 1976 photograph 
of the deep of the Lackawanna Depot at Gregsville. I don't know what uh, uh, happened to the film. I think it was uh, it was an off-brand film. Anyway, uh, I think I'm not making any excuses for it. That we, we, uh, we mentioned the Dan's uh, Genesee in Wyoming. The Stub Ellis was a caboose at, uh, I think it was an ex Lackawanna Railroad caboose, uh, probably named for the conductor on, on, on the, on the train. They had two cabooses that I know of. And uh, I think this was an ex uh, Lackawanna uh, caboose. These photos were taken at the bicentennial year, 1976, majority of them at, at, at Retzoff. 1976 was the bicentennial. The railroad uh, industry got into the bicentennial spirit, and a number of railroads painted red, white, and blue on their locomotives. The, the Erie Lackawanna did it. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad did it. The Baltimore and Ohio did it. Virtually uh, all of the, uh, the big trunk line railroads did it. And uh, some of them to this day, believe it or not, are still painted in the bicentennial colors. Pardon? Oh, your stepfather. Okay. He worked on the Genesee in Wyoming? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was his name? No, I didn't know him. I knew a fellow by the name of, um, he worked on, he was a brakeman on the Lackawanna over at uh, Groveland there, but it seems to me his name was Clark or something. Clark. Huh? Clark, they call him? I think so, yeah. He was a brakeman on the Lackawanna, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a, another clerk. This is the office complex of the Genesee in Wyoming and the shop. That's actually the engine house complex of the Genesee in Wyoming at Retzel. This is just about, this is a few years after they built it, and they, they, they pretty well maintained that complex over there. And of course, they had it all cleaned up for the centennial. And every year, the Genesee in Wyoming, once a year, would had an open house. And people would come from all over and, and really enjoyed the, uh, uh, the open house that the, that the railroad put on. But of course, that's just, uh, a lot of a thing of the past now. But I was there on several occasions. It's huh. me. It's you? And my boy. And my two sons. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that coincidence? There you are. Check, check the plaid pants. Uh, <laughs> it was the 70s. Talk, talk, about, talk about coincidence. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? You never know what you're yeah, going to. <laughs> you never know what you're going to come up with. Yeah, with these, you see, we even have a gun. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> you go from matching pants. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I think they had two of those centennial. <laughs> I'm not. I'm pretty sure they did. That's one of those old alcoves, uh, one of the original uh, Genesee and Wyoming alcoves. That's when the shop was first open, I guess, the first new. They did have two of those uh, painted up in uh, bicentennial colors. That's for the car shop, I think, right in the back. Uh, that's behind the engine house. The private car, Edward the One. I, I don't know the story on that. Uh, I knew they had one. I don't know if they still uh, have that car. Sure. Huh? Still Edward Fuller. He was one of the owners. Okay. They still have that, that car still in existence? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not car, either. The car might be in existence, but they don't own it. Okay. Well, that was their first business car, I assume. <coughs> now, remember, th this is the other caboose. Of, uh, this is also an ex. A lack of one caboose. One of those cabooses went to a museum down at Darien, uh, New York, or Darien Center, and uh, then it was moved from there. I don't know where it went to. That museum went belly up, and they moved it to some other museum. So I have no idea where that car is to this day. Now uh, this is the uh, private car, Edward the One, hooked, uh, tied onto a caboose, and. Uh, I don't know the, uh, the occasion for this uh, for this uh, movement, but uh, 
somebody's either checking the car over or they're checking a, a consist or uh, checking a way bill or something. A Russell snowplow, the Genesee and Wyoming had one. Uh, I don't know whatever happened to that snowplow, whether that was scrapped or not. That, and the photographs of earlier Porter steam locomotives built by H, they had five steam locomotives built by H.K. Porter. And that, uh, uh, that, that same uh, snowplow appears in that, uh, on that Porter collection. And somebody <coughs> estimates, uh, it thought, it, it, it come to the conclusion that was not, was not a Russell snowplow, but it was rather a Porter built snowplow. But that's conjecture on my part, because I don't know. I assumed it was uh, Russell, but it could well have been an H.K. Porter. H.K. Porter was a locomotive works down Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Here's an early view of the uh, engine house at, uh, at Retzoff. There's a, evidently a, a, a car, a salt car being repaired in there as well. I'm not sure how many tracks, I think there was five tracks in there. Again, another shot of the Stub Alice. Now uh, these are, are cars that rets off the International Salt Mine that rets off. I don't know if these are lowers or empties. This was kind of an evening shot. Uh, the railroad had uh, quit for the day. They used normally, uh, the operation for years on the Genesee in Wyoming was a day yard job to make up the salt train, and then they had, then ran a train over from, from uh, Brett's off over to uh, p &L Junction. They'd take the loads out and bring the empties back. Uh, well, unless they were to the Lackawanna, and then the yard job would take them up uh, almost to the, uh, the, uh, the, the highway crossing on Route 36 and yard the cars up there for the Lackawanna pickup or the Erie Lackawanna pickup. This is the... This general, this is the office in, uh, and uh, uh, engine house complex again at Rett's office. A little different view of it. Notice the flower gardens around the. Evidently, somebody was uh, taking good care of the property. Uh, this is the back end of the car shop. I don't know how many cars they could get in there. Probably two or three at the most. That's Mr. Johnson. I don't know what his, what his title was on the Genesee in Wyoming, whether he was general manager or what. But it looks to me like uh, there's a derailment there. One of, those, one of those locomotives hit a frog. In fact, I, I know it was a derailment. This is the uh, Rochester, uh, Genesee in Wyoming, 61. This is a salt train up at uh, Goodman Avenue uh, in Rochester. After the Genesee and Wyoming uh, had uh, acquired trackage rights on the Rochester and Southern, they would come up uh, to Rochester. They'd bring solid uh, salt trains into our yard at Goodman Avenue, and they'd drop them, and they'd pick up the, uh, the uh, empties and take them from return to the rest off. Normally, this was a night job and you wouldn't see it during the day. But once in a while, uh, uh, some occurrence would happen that they would have to run a day train. So this is one of those rare occasions when they ran a, a day assault train up to Goodman Avenue. Back in 1978, the uh, Genesee and Wyoming uh, operated a couple of excursion trains. The reason being they were a fundraiser for some uh, a young person who had uh, some serious illness and they wanted to uh, use this as a fundraiser. And so they ran uh, three or four trips between uh, Retsoff and p and Junction. I think they charged us seven or eight dollars. I can't remember what we paid to, to ride this train. But they had an engine on both ends of the train. Uh, this is the opposite end of the train. This is one of those... Uh, uh, MP15s, yeah, thank you. And I, I don't know, 
whose equipment, they might have been the Western New York Railroad Historical Society cars, I'm not sure. This is some of the very old rare, uh, this is an old Model A with fl railroad flange wheels on it, and that looks like a compressor car. And I think that uh, this was used by the maintenance of way department. Just over, I don't know whether all this stuff uh, went to, I suppose it jumped right on the property. Now, uh, Howard mentioned the, the, uh, the, 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 the Pennsylvania Rochester branch. Uh, it, it went out of a couple of di different nicknames. It went to, we, on, on the railroad, we called it the San Ye. Uh, the general public uh, used it, called it the pigtails. But uh, the reason I think we called it the San Ye was the fact that it, we used to deliver coal to that uh, epileptic hospital at San Ye and uh, uh, it was kind of a joke between the, the railroaders, uh, the name of this uh, branch. So uh, uh, they would get together in the crew room and, and, and uh, they say, well, where are you going to go today? Well, we're going up to San Ye. So they would, that would be, that mean the, they was going up the Rochester branch. Now, this is a typical, this is the tr a typical passion, Pennsylvania Railroad passenger train that ran between Olean and Rochester. Uh, this is up in Rochester. This is what we call a, an E6, a 442 an Atlantic type locomotive. Uh, the, these were the heaviest uh, steam locomotives that they could run in passenger service. The heaviest they could run in freight service was what we call an L1 or Macado 282. Uh, but there was also a bunch of lighter engines mixed uh, H9 and H10 class locomotives. The H9 and H10s were used on basically as yard switchers. Here's an H10 at Rochester. They used them on the local freights and they used them on the yard jobs. They, at one time they had two yard jobs there and they, had, they kept two, two of these H10 class engines at, at Rochester. This is some of the, uh, as Howard has showed you up, uh, up on, the, on the desk up there, a couple of them RS1s. These were the replacements for the steam engines on the uh, branch between Rochester and Olean. Now, I don't know, Howard? Where is he? Yeah. Uh, want to give him a little explanation on this? Thank you, Howard. Here's what this is up to Fowlerville. This is one of those, um, I think the, the uh, I don't know what caused this to be, probably uh, uh, broken rail. I assume that that's what happened. This is supposed to be uh, east of Avon, and uh, this is this. Uh, Normally they run one of those gas electric or hoodle uh, type vehicles up on this railroad, but when they broke down, they'd have to re uh, use uh, run steam engines again. And once in a while, they would haul the gas electric back to the shop in Olean for repairs. And it might take a couple of days. In the meantime, they'd run a steam engine for a couple of days, and then they put the gas electric car on. The gas electric car went out about 1938. Here's the uh, uh, Sterling Salt, uh, this is off a very old postcard, Kylerville. I think Kylerville is in uh, Livingston County. Uh, I think this is the Pennsylvania Railroad into this salt works. Yeah, I 
I might mention the, uh, they actually had this, a separate railroad running into, uh, that Sterling Mine had its own connection to the Pennsylvania Railroad called the Haylight Northern. That, uh, if you look on your map, you'll see the Haylight Northern is a dotted line. It uh, was built in the 1920s, it lasted about 15 years. It, uh, it served as, not the Red Sox shaft, but the Sterling shaft. And that's why uh, there appears to be two, you know, two connections from the salt mine area to Pennsylvania. Tennessee salt work at the fire. The only Pennsylvania station, by the way, that's still in existence on this branch is at Fifard, and it's been moved off to the right of way, and it's now a, a, a private residence. I've never uh, been able to photograph that building. I never found the owner at home, so I didn't want to go in there and take uh, uh, unauthorized photographs or uh, unauthorized slides. Mount Morris. This is where the, the Rochester branch of the Pennsylvania crossed the main line of the Lackawanna. It's on your map. I don't know which one of these maps it's on. From, Ro from Mount Morris to, Ro to Olean was uphill. A, a train of coal going into Rochester could run from all the end of Rochester with one engine. Coming back, the grade was steep. The, the train was a train of empties, but they had to have a second engine to get the, the hills were that steep that they had to have a second engine to uh, bring the train down from uh, the second engine would come up from Olean to Mount Morris, couple onto the empty coal train, and take it back to Olean. This is just outside of Mount Morris. If you know where the uh, coal, there's a coal storage plant up there, just a little bit north of uh, the village of Mount Morris, and this is about the approximate location. Well, I've been across that diamond many times, more times on the Lackawanna than I have on the Pensy, but I've crossed the Pensy quite a few times too. <coughs> this is the Pennsylvania up through. Uh, Mount Morris. I, there's a photograph right here, uh, uh, eight by ten of this, uh, uh, virtually the same location. You want to tell who, who's that? This is the 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 the, uh, the dam at uh, Mount Morris. The railroad bridge is in the background. The highway bridge uh, is in the foreground. This is, the, this is the only photograph I've ever seen of the, of the Pennsylvania station at Mount Morris. I don't know what year. I know that building was still in existence in, as far as, as up until 1963, and possibly a couple of years after that before it was either torn down or removed or burnt or whatever happened to it. The track supervisor's office for the branch was in, in that building. Now, my Aunt Maud Reddy Parker was agent there for a number of years. She was agent at every station between Olean and Rochester. She virtually spent her entire railroad career uh, at, 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 at all the stations on that branch. So uh, her son, Jack Parker, a now retired uh, uh, guidance counselor from Belmont, w worked on a section of, the, of this railroad during his uh, years at Cornell. And uh, he would tell me tales about various uh, individuals. And I, I, I can't remember them all, but uh, the fellow that was the most prominent name was a, uh, the track supervisor by the name of Butler. He had four sons that worked for the railroad, but I don't think any of them worked between Oleander and Rochester. I think they worked more on the main line of the railroad. He was the last track supervisor at uh, Mount Morris. This is a flood picture. I don't know. This is a very early flood picture, and uh, I don't have a, uh, this is off of an old photograph or a postcard. I don't know which. No location. At, all we know is the Pennsylvania Railroad, but I've never been able to pinpoint a location on this. 1949, the Buffalo chapter of the National Railway Historical Society operated a railroad excursion 
over the New York Central from Buffalo to Rochester, and over to Pennsylvania from Rochester to Olean, and up from Olean back up to Buffalo. Uh, we had two excursions. We had one in 1949, and we had another one in 1953. Uh, this was the first what we call the Russell H. Shapley excursion. Russell H. Shapley was our charter, our founder of our chapter. And so uh, after his uh, death, we uh, honored him every year with an excursion train on some railroad with his name on it. And this was, uh, this was the uh, 1949 version of it. My Aunt Ma Red, uh, Red, uh, Maud Reddy Parker was agent here. Now, uh, Howard has mentioned this, the uh, branch of Swains. This building was the original station built at Nunday and uh, was two miles from Nunday Junction. And uh, in later years, my, my Aunt Maud was the last agent there and she closed the, uh, she closed the building. If you'll notice the extreme right, the outhouse. I don't want to impose on you anymore, but uh, would you give a little bit about that uh, Mr. Smith that was the operator on that, uh, on that? Oh, that was a different, okay, that's a really different story, though. That's, um, that was Bert Smith, uh, another guy, actually lives just across the river from where I live now in Rossburg, and uh, he died at age 106. He might have been the oldest Conrail pensioner alive at the time. He died about 19, in the late 1980s, but I interviewed him. He, had, he was another person with amazing recollections, and he was a telegrapher, Bert Smith is his name, he, he, one of his jobs, early jobs with the Pennsylvania Railroad, this is a sort of a mobile telegrapher, and he would ride the trains on the Swains branch through on day, and uh, they would stop to get orders, he'd take out his portable gear and plug into a station and receive orders for the train to proceed or wait for the wait for the wait to uh, Yeah, that, that's really another story. This, uh, this Clarence Copey, he had a boyhood memory of Monday and the abandonment of the Swains Branch. One of the things he remembered when the Swains Branch was abandoned is that they were using little small hand car type uh, deals to remove the track. It was removed from Swains on Northwood through Monday. And um, he remembers one time going off to his friend and <coughs> taking these track, these cars and actually riding them on the track and still up down the hill into the village, although he says he never. <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me when he was 95. He <laughs> figured you wouldn't spank him. Yeah. <laughs> Tuscarora. Original. Most of the, most of the uh, stations on the Rochester branch were kind of like a standard. Uh, um, 
form. Uh, I don't know as all of them were, but uh, a good proportion of them were. This is a wreck at Tuscarora. This is the, the one of the very last <coughs> steam uh, trains that they, uh, prior to the dieselization, they had to have two wreckers. They had one out of only end on the, on the Pennsylvania. On the other end of the wreck, they had a New York Central wrecker out of Rochester. And uh, they uh, had cars all over the place. Uh, people come along and they would, when they'd come to the produce cars, they'd pick everything up along the track and they, as much as they could take before the, uh, the railroad soft deal come up and stop them. <laughs> but as soon as the soft deal went, well, they were back picking up the, the fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Is there a date on that though? In 1953. Hmm. No, I was, yeah, that's 1953. About the last year they ran steam. This is West Nun Day. This is the crossing where the, the Greenway, this is West uh, uh, Route 4, four, eight. four eight, yeah. This is where the Greenway now crosses the uh, uh, Route 408. We had a baggage car with uh, slats across us so people could look out the, the baggage car doors and snap pictures. Uh, this is down at Oakland. This is uh, the yeah, one of the locks, yeah. They're restoring, making a walking trail along that now as part of the, the park. Well, I included this because it's down below Deep Cut. And uh, uh, it's, it's part of the history of the, uh, uh, the Genesee Valley Railroad. And uh, uh, I just want to include it because uh, I, I'd like to see it restored. I'd love to see it restored. I hope they... they got it pretty good right now. Good. I'm glad to hear it. This picture here was at Deep Cut. They stopped there at Deep Cut. Everybody got out to take pictures. And uh, uh, they backed the train up and they had a four to run by. And then backed the train up again and everybody loaded on. Those that wanted to take pictures. We one of the first road to run by that I ever remember uh, being, uh, having anything to do with it. Deep cut, site of the Genesee Valley Canal, 1852-1877. That sign, in the wintertime you can see it. In the summertime it's probably pretty well grown up with weeds. Nobody ever bothers to, it's a shame that they don't uh, uh, trim some of those weeds so the people on the highway can see that sign. Now this is a this this a uh, uh, picture, 1918, typical excursion train on the on the Pennsylvania Railroad between Rochester and Letchworth Park. For one dollar, you could have a round trip from Rochester to Letchworth Park and back to <coughs> Rochester. Spend the day enjoying the park, going to the Cascade House, going to any number of of uh, hotels, walking around, doing whatever you. This was the. Uh, prior to the, course of the time of automobiles, and the uh, majority of people didn't own them. And uh, uh, up above, you can see the top of the, port, the uh, Erie Portage Bridge. This is the Genesee River looking south at Lesherith Park going towards Old End. Basically, the railroad is on the canal towpath. On your, uh, on your right, of course, is the Genesee River. Now uh, this is another view, uh, the opposite side. This is going up towards north, towards Rochester. Bridge, yeah, uh, right off the top of the Portageville Bridge. You're right. Both of these, are, by the way, are off postcards. Uh, there's another view uh, on the opposite side of the, uh, showing the railroad grade and the towpath and. The, the Genesee River. Apparently, when this picture, when this was taken, <coughs> uh, the, the Genesee River was shallow. But in the, way in the background, you can see the Erie Portage Bridge. Another view, looking north. This is the bridge across the Genesee River. Howard mentioned the abutments are there at Portageville to this day. 
This this is where the uh, the, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad went across the top of the Genesee River. You're looking right straight into Portageville. <coughs> this was the original uh, way that the uh, Genesee Valley Canal came over the Genesee River. Uh, after the railroad was abandoned, they, they, uh, they put the rails right across this uh, uh, bridge. You can still see in the back. Some of those buildings in the background in Portageville are actually still there. I don't know which ones, but uh, I had a friend of mine tell me a while back which ones, but uh, uh, at the time, I, I, there was too much. He told me it was too much, so I don't know which buildings are there and which ones aren't. This is the same excursion train going south uh, between uh, taking off the top of the Erie Bridge. This is a, a classic photograph of a Pennsylvania Railroad passenger train. I mentioned the Cascade House. The Cascade House was a very old hotel. It was up for uh, uh, historic landmark uh, status. And uh, at the time that I took these pictures, I was working on a work train. We were at Portage Bridge. They, the track gang was doing work on the bridge. We were sitting there on the engine and uh, Maybe once an hour or something, they'd have us move the car a few feet so they could uh, replace some ties. So when I had a few spare moments, I went down and I took a picture. In fact, I took two pictures of the Cascade House, and I walked around inside it. And uh, it wasn't very long after that that vandals got up there, and they decided they were going to uh, burn the place, and they did. Right. Yep. This is the front end of the Cascade House. Boy, the architecture of that building, unbelievable. Where is it? Where was it? On the, on the east end, the Portage Bridge. Right now, if you come off, if you cross into Livingston County at Portageville, there, as soon as you cross the bridge on, uh, what's that road, 438, uh, there's a, a path that goes up along the, uh, a, 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 drive, a, a place you can drive in and a path, and that goes right by where that building used to come. And there's a dirt road that comes out the other side of the park, and you can drive up there on a dirt road, and you can still see the location of it. I, and that's on the east end of, that's over in the Livingston This is in Livingston County, actually. Uh, this is the Genesee Falls Hotel in Portageville at a Falls, Fourth of July celebration. I don't, huh? Oh, it's across the road from the. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's the that's the other building. Okay. I'm glad you pointed that out because I I, I wasn't familiar with that. Uh, that was the Fourth of July celebration. I don't know what year. That's come out of a postcard. Indeed. <laughs> Very much so. There's the Portage Hill, the Genesee Falls Hotel. That been, uh, that I think is a National Historic Landmark now too. They have excellent meals in there. I think they have some gourmet uh, foods in there that you can't get any place else. This is that original Portage Bridge across the uh, Genesee River in a test train of <coughs> six locomotives. In 1874, after they had just built the bridge they just built the bridge in 47 days, and the quickest way to try it out would be to run as heavy load as they could over it, which was six inches or so. <laughs> who, who did they draw a straw to see who the engineer was? I think the engineers got off at one end of the bridge, and they went over without engineers. <laughs> I don't think this is an actual photograph. I think this is a drawing. What, year, what happened years ago, and these itinerant photographers would go out and they'd take uh, pictures. They would send them to Europe, they, especially to Germany, France, or England. They'd make postcards out of them, and they'd return them to this, this country. Then they would go around and they'd sell them at stores, uh, grocery stores, drug stores, anywhere they could 
sell those pictures, and that's how these people made their living. Huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. I've got quite a number of these uh, Portage Bridge uh, uh, postcards. Bridge is 237 uh, feet high. When it was built, the bridge was built in 1853 or 2. It was the highest bridge in the world. Are there any pictures of that? Sure. Here he had a couple of other, they had a, 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 they had a bridge at Ken Zufan. Now this is east of the portage. This is the, the railroad after it was tore up. This is the east end of uh, Leisure Park. This is the grade of the railroad now. This is over on the living. This is, I think, this was part of Trail Seven. And this is a. Uh, this was taken off the grade, showing uh, the part of the remains of the canal. This was P&L Junction that Howard was talking about. These are uh, Genesee and Wyoming salt cars. The, the, the building in the, uh, the B&O building is uh, painted B&O colors. This train has just come out of the, uh, from off the Genesee in Wyoming. This is a bunch of, uh, another bunch of salt cars. This is also P&L Junction. This is the original station at P&L and Lehigh Junction. P&L Junction, one side of it was the, was the uh, Lehigh Valley, and I think the other side was the B&O. B&O, yeah. So the depot was evidently used by both railroads. There's several of those depot buildings up there at, uh, at the, uh, Montford, right? This is the original, uh, this engine was engine number 38. It came off the Huntington at Broad Top Mountain. It was the original steam excursion. In, or, no, it was the second engine that the, that the Livonia Avenue in Lakeville had. They uh, had another locomotive that they got out of West Virginia. Uh, the federal man, uh, they never washed the boiler on it. And the federal man gigged the engine and they strapped it right on the spot at Livonia. This engine, was the next, this one was up at, at uh, Dr. Groman's uh, museum just north of Syracuse. He, they brought it down to uh, Livonia and uh, used it for a few years. Then eventually they sold it to the Knox and Kane Railroad. Right now it's in the shop at Marionville, Pennsylvania, along with a Chinese locomotive. And uh, it, it, it has been available service. When the Knox and Kane first started, uh, this was the uh, engine they had, and then, when, of course, when they bought the ch original Chinese engine, they they used this for a uh, backup engine. But it's going to be used again this summer. Uh, this is down at Sabona. This is in uh, uh, down along that Erie.